Well, well, okay. So um, I think it's now uh, six minutes past the hour, six minutes past uh, 10 o'clock um, in St. Petersburg. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Eckhard Ruhl from Freie Universität Berlin. It is my pleasure to chair this uh, plenary lecture that is given by P Professor Peter Tolstoy from St. Petersburg State University. So it's a warm double trot uh, to St. Petersburg. And uh, let me briefly introduce our plenary speaker um, <clears throat> who will talk about cyclic self-association of XOH acids, uh, dimers, trimers, tetramers, and cages. And uh, he um, studied uh, physics at St. Petersburg State University from the years 1994 till 2000. And he started his dissertation in a joint um, a project with, uh, between Professor Denisov and Professor Limbach. And uh, there um, he worked, uh, or he started working also in the field of hydrogen bonding and intermolecular interactions, where he uh, did um, or he studied the HD isotope effect <coughs> via C13 NMR spectroscopy. And uh, he came after he finished his dissertation as a postdoc to Freie Universität Berlin, where he stayed in this position for four years from 2004 and 2008. And this was a time when we met for the first time in person in the same institute. And I remember this with a great pleasure. He became then in 2008, the group leader uh, and uh, uh, that he uh, was at Freie Universität Berlin till 2010. He had a shorter stay at the Mark Spawn Institute in Berlin. Um, this is a institute for uh, ultra uh, fast dynamics. And then he returned to St. Petersburg in 2011, uh, where he became the uh, director of the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Resource Center. And he stayed as a director till 2018. But since almost 10 years, he is a professor in physical chemistry and uh, his research interest is uh, NMR spectroscopy, molecular spectroscopy, hydrogen bonding, intermolecular interactions. And this is, we will hear uh, uh, recent work from his field. Professor Tolstoy, thank you for joining here, Science and Progress, for giving this plenary lecture. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Ruhl, for this very detailed description. <clears throat> I am very happy that I have a pleasure to speak at this conference, and I apologize that I was unable to be more actively present during the other uh, sessions, but, you know, sometimes teaching duties get in the way, and that was uh, the case for me during this uh, conference. But, uh, well, let me share uh, my screen and then I will start uh, the presentation. All right, I hope that you can see my uh, my slides on your screen. So, okay. well, uh, it seems to be, uh, the, the work I'm about to uh, uh, describe was done in my work group in St. Petersburg University, which is, if uh, one counts uh, every member of it, including this bachelor students, will be about 20 people strong. Uh, and the people who contributed most to the, uh, to the material I'm about to show are highlighted in red in this slide. Now, uh, generally speaking, it seems uh, to be a fact of nature that uh, organic molecules tend to aggregate. Now, uh, organic molecules, they do have uh, various shapes and sizes represented in this slide by different geometric shapes. And by forming aggregates, they can eventually form various type of clusters, 
chains or ligomers, globules, micelles, nanotubes. There are so many names for different types of aggregates. Now, uh, what is common for all of them is that they are somehow energetically beneficial. That's why they are being formed. They are held by non-covalent interactions. I mean, if they would be held by covalent interactions, we would rather speak about polymerization reactions and such. And they also live long enough to be detected. If they would live shorter, they will be uh, uh, not detected and we will not discuss them either. For example, the whole human body may be considered as the supramolecular aggregate held mostly by non-covalent interactions. If uh, for a brief moment of time, uh, one switches, would switch off uh, hydrogen bonds uh, in the human body, uh, something like uh, this would happen, like in this famous scene from the, uh, the, the fabulous destiny of uh, Amelie movie, uh, Actually, the, the body will turn into a pool of water. Not even that, uh, the water is still held by hydrogen bonds. So it actually will evaporate, turn into gas. And the amount of energy stored in the hydrogen bonds in just one human body is approximately equivalent to 10 kilograms of TNT. So it will be quite a big kablumi. But this is beyond the point. I'm kind of uh, getting in tangent here. Now... Uh, if we think of, a, of, of a, some molecule, some organic molecule, uh, and I will be talking about hydrogen bonds here, which has uh, where, where, how does it go? Which has one proton donating spot, and right on the opposite side, it will have a proton accepting spot. The molecule of this shape and size uh, would rather form cyclic, uh, sorry, uh, chains, infinite chains. They kind of stack. Now, if one think of another molecule that has proton donating group and proton accepting group on the same side, then such molecule would be able to form cyclic dimers and again, infinite chains. While continuing this logic, if one um, imagines a molecule where proton donating and proton accepting spots are kind of at an angle, then these molecules would be able to form, well, in this particular case, cyclic trimers, and again, infinite chains. Chains seem to be quite often an option. Now, this is not the whole set of, uh, the, the whole variety of possible complexation motifs. <clears throat> if one adds more proton donating and accepting spots, then more possibilities arise and in this case, where there's uh, this configuration of proton donating and accepting groups, one would be able to form sort of two-dimensional sheets that can be extended in all four directions indefinitely. Now, one can play this game quite uh, for, for quite a long time. Now, here is uh, yet another molecule with a weird configuration of proton donating and accepting spots and different kind of complexation would be possible in this case, still occupying all proton donating and all proton accepting uh, vacancies. Now, this would be sort of a ribbons. And various three-dimensional structures are, of course, possible, but they are harder to show on the slide. So I just showed the ones I do. Now, the simplest case in organic chemistry of a molecule being able to act as a proton donor, as a proton acceptor, is perhaps a carboxylic acid, which has one proton donating spot OH group and one proton accepting spots, the carbonyl group, in the two lone pairs on the oxygen. Now, this molecule, according to the configuration of these spots, has two options. It can either form infinite chains, and that's what formic and acetic acids do in crystal state, or it can form cyclic dimers. The majority of other carboxylic acids crystallize as cyclic dimers, and even formic and acetic acid do that as well, but mostly in a gas phase or in solution. Now, phosphenic acids are slightly more tricky. Phosphenic acids are the ones which have the O. POH group and not OCOH group. Now, the phosphenic acids, in case if their substituents are mm, uh, less bulky, they're smaller in the in in physical size, they tend to, like, like two methyls over here, one methyl, one phenyl, or two phenyls, such molecules 
tend to form infinite chains of different degree of, how should I put it, zigzagginess, but infinite chains nonetheless. Now, if the substituents get larger, like terbutyl groups, uh, triphenyl uh, groups, or heavily substituted phenyls, then <laughs> such phosphenic acids would rather form cyclic diamers. And I think it's possible to rationalize this behavior if one thinks about a molecule as a kind of proton accepting and donating spot more or less on the same side of the molecule, but a large substituent. The formation of cyclic dimers is still possible for larger substituents. That's fine. Now, the formation of infinite chains breaks because extra molecules cannot approach it. The bulky substituents get on the way. Now, that was phosphenic acids. Now, phosphoric acids, that's the ones with four oxygens close to phosphorus, uh, like this one, diphenyl phosphate, which in my view looks like a little bit like a bee with the two wings over here. Now, they tend to crystallize as crystal hydrates. And you know, as bees, they uh, would prefer to make hexagonal uh, honeycombs. Uh, so these acid as well crystallizes in sort of a sheet with a hexagonal pattern. Let me highlight one of the acid molecules. I have removed here phenoxy groups for better visibility, but I can add them back and then it looks even more like a bee in a honeycomb. Now in this pattern, these uh, anions of the acids, uh, which are kind of every second uh, spot here is occupied by the acid, are alternating with protonated water dimers with a strong OH or hydrogen bond. If I would visualize the, uh, uh, the diphenyl phosphate as the object with four proton accepting sites, like four long pairs on these two oxygens, and if, if I visualize the protonated water dimer as an object with four proton donating spots, like these hanging OH protons. And actually what happens is the formation of this alternating pattern. So that's how it crystallizes. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, arsenic acids, we keep going down the periodic table. That's, these are the ones with the O arsenicum OH group. And this is the example of cacodylic acid, the dimethyl arsenic acid. They tend to have a polymorphism in crystal state. And the uh, cacodylic acid is uh, one of such acids. It can either be crystallized from some solvents as cyclic dimers, or from other solvents, it crystallizes in a form of infinite chains, which could be visualized as, you know, this Ouroboros or just chain of snakes eating each other. Okay. But that was all in crystal state where direct crystallographic methods were possible. So the configuration of how things self-associate was uh, um, kind of directly observed by experiment. But what happens in liquids? In liquids, crystallographic methods are uh, hardly applicable. So at least the ones with the atomic resolution. So one has to rely on indirect methods, for example, on spectroscopic methods. And that's what we were doing in our group and for uh, quite some time. And the two experimental tricks are up our sleeve um, to do this work. First of all, uh, we um, use liquefied deuterated freonic gases as solvents. At room temperature, they're gaseous, but at high, uh, at, uh, they can be pressurized into liquid or at lower temperature, they become liquid and they can be stored in a heavy duty NMR sample tubes that can withstand the pressure of up to seven bar, still being made out of borosilicon glass. I think it's an engineering feat to have such a uh, carefully manufactured glass tubes. Now, using the low freezing solvent, we can cool down the sample area down to 100 Kelvin. It's kind of beyond what the NMR spectrometer uh, producing companies allow, but 
it's still possible. So we can cool down the sample area to low temperature and it does not freeze. These are the freonic gases, they become liquid and non-viscous too. Uh, so one can obtain good uh, high resolution and a mass spectra. But having low temperature, first of all, we shift the equilibrium towards complexation, towards this, this aggregation we want to study. And we also slow down various kinds of chemical exchange which can mess up the NMR spectra due to averaging. So these are all good things. Now, the second trick up our sleeve is partial deuteration of the complexes. Now, complexes with several hydrogen bonds can be partially deuterated. Like this is the example of a cyclic dimer of, let's say, carboxylic acid with two identical bridging protons giving rise to one single line in the proton spectrum. But after the partial deuteration where the geometries of hydrogen bond change, so do NMR spectra. And the proton which stays unsubstituted would resonate a different chemical shift. And by appearance of the new lines, we can uh, count the number of isotopologs which are possible in the complex. And by doing so, to count the number of hydrogen bonds. And figure out the stoichiometry of the complex. Now, here is the kind of um, uh, experiment, one of the first experimental examples of these, uh, these ideas, this approach. Cyclic dimer of acetic acid, two protons, one chemical shift, like it should be, partial deuteration, change geometry of the remaining hydrogen bond, and it appears, resonates a different chemical shift. And by counting the number of lines, we can see how many proton containing non-chemically equivalent isotopologs are possible and figure out that that's indeed a cyclic dimer. For example, uh, arsenic acid, and this is again the cacodylic acid in solution, they do exactly, the, the, this acid does exactly this. There's one sig signal at low temperature which after partially deuteration splits into two and the intensity of the second line is proportional to the degree of deuteration. So we can safely say that these acids form predominantly cyclic dimers at low temperature. Now for phenic and phosphoric acids, they again a bit trickier. They form two kinds of self-associates in solution, which are coexisting in a slow exchange regime because the temperature was very low, about 100 Kelvin. What, what are the stoichiometry of these complexes? After partial deuteration, one of the signals splits into two, and that's cyclic dimer, like carboxylic, like arsenic. But the other signal after partial deuteration splits into three. And this is the sign of the cyclic trimer. Indeed, in the cyclic trimer, the, uh, there are several isotopologs possible. The initial one, three protons, two protons, one deuteron, two deuteron, one proton, and three deuterons. Three deuterons does not contribute to the proton spectrum. So uh, that's a cyclic trimerization, which is a relatively rare type of self-association. There are not so many examples of this uh, behavior, and it would be nice to figure out why these molecules tend to trimerize. We tried for different phosphenic and phosphoric acids, then they all seem to behave in a similar way. And I think uh, the answer uh, is connected to the following. If we look at the, uh, electron, uh, the electron localization function around OPO group for phosphoric acids, let's focus on that. We can do the same for phosphenic acids. We can see that proton accepting abilities are kind of spread on a cone and are not necessarily lying in the OPO plane. The proton donating ability is also not lying in the OPO plane because the, it's a non-planar OPOH group in the equilibrium state. In other words, we can draw a phosphenic or phosphoric acid molecule as having a cone of proton donating abilities and a cone of proton accepting abilities, which opens up the largest set of possibilities, how they can approach each other and what kind of complexes they can make. Now, uh, carboxylic acids having very strictly directed proton donating and proton accepting abilities, they look like a Lego brick that is designed to form cyclic dimers or infinite chains. 
This is this kind of brick. You can, two of them can approach each other and then just make a dimer. Now, our phosphenic and phosphoric acid, they rather look like a uh, skewed Lego brick, which Lego company does not produce, luckily. But uh, this Lego brick has the proton donating ability, uh, is um, kind of looking one direction, and proton accepting ability looking another direction. And if one tries to assemble these Lego bricks and brings a second molecule and carefully places it so they match nicely, the remaining dimer has a gap which can nicely be closed by a third molecule. It just geometrically fits, forming this kind of trimer, which could remind the Penrose triangle, which is an impossible triangle, but in chemistry it is possible because it's impossible to be made out of the uh, out of the straight bricks, but out of the bent bricks, you still can do it. So these molecules are kind of bent, so they can more form this Penrose triangle. Because all the phosphenic and phosphoric acid that we had the chance to look at behave in a similar way, one can mix and match them to form to form cyclic trimers uh, containing three molecules of one type or three molecules of another type or any kind of mixed combination. They all form. Now, the situation is different if one tries to mix phosphenic or phosphoric and arsenic acids. Now, once again, this is the phosphoric acid, the Lego brick, highly skewed. In the same uh, logic, the arsenic acid being larger in size because of the larger size of the central arsenicum atom, they are less skewed, actually, if one looks at the electronic structure of the monomer. So trying to assemble something out of such Lego bricks, one comes to the following um, observation, that, uh, as I has mentioned, the phosphenic acid forms cyclic trimers. That's their preferred configuration. Arsenic acid preferred to form cyclic dimers. That's not very, it's not a perfect fit, but it's better than the others. A persistent kid would, can form a dimer out of these bricks. Now, when we try to mix it, what this is what happens. It's possible to remove one of the phosphenic acid molecules, open up a little bit wider two remaining molecules, and fit a larger arsenic acid molecule. Or one can open the dimer of arsenic acids and still fit a smaller phosphenic acid molecule. So mixed trimers are also possible in this case. You mentioned that uh, to uh, slightly to our surprise, if one mixes two phosphenic, uh, or phosphenic and phosphoric acids, as in this example, there are other complexes that I had not mentioned so far, uh, which look very simple in the proton spectrum, just giving rise to one sing singlet. But after partial deuteration, they suddenly split into up to seven different isotopologues. But actually, one can understand why this happens if one considers what kind of tetramers these molecules can form. So let's call one of the molecules A and the other molecule B. Now, the cyclic tetramers can be of four different kinds. Three molecules of A and one molecule of B. Two molecules of A and two molecules of B in two different configurations, alternating or just two of one kind and two of the other kind, and three molecules of B and one molecule of A. Just out of symmetry considerations, out of general logic and reasoning, what could expect a different number of lines of these tetramers in proton spectra, in phosphorus spectra, and different number of chemically non-equivalent isotopes, just from the symmetry consideration. And here's all written. And indeed, one of these tetramers has only one proton signal and seven isotopologues and two lines of equal intensity and phosphorus spectrum that I didn't show. For other combinations of acid, we were also able to find another tetramer configuration as well. And I have to say that if trimers are rare, cyclic tetramers are rarer still. Not so many examples. I actually don't know any example apart of phosphoric acids that cyclically tetramerize as a preferred configuration.
continuing the logic of phosphonic, phosphoric acids, we come to phosphonic acids. These are the ones with two OH groups. And if we uh, make this uh, quantum mechanical structure and add the cones of proton donating and proton accepting ability, we could speculate that even more possibilities here exist of how to complexate. So we try to study what do these molecules form in solution. But first of all, we looked at what they do in the solid state. So there are three motifs of how phosphonic acids crystallize. They can crystallize in sort of a ribbons. I remove in all these pictures substituents for visual clarity. They can form a sort of a ribbons making dimers, 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 dimers chain. They can form sort of columns where they have trimers, 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 trimers. A bit weird trimers, but still ladder of trimers. They can form two dimensional sheets where dimers are alternating with the kind of a larger cycles of many molecules. All three kinds of structures have been experimentally observed for different phosphonic acids. But what happens in solution? So we measured the spectra, we analyzed it. I will not spend time on the, uh, on the analysis of the spectra. Uh, you will have to believe me that by listing all the features of this spectra, we can slowly narrow down the number of possibilities of what this, this could be. And eventually we come to realization that this is what happens in solution. It takes four molecules and that's how they associate. Two of them can form cyclic dimer, but there are two hanging OH groups in this dimer and two unoccupied lone pairs on the phosphonyl oxygens. Two other molecules approach each other, make a cyclic dimer, and also they have two hanging OH groups and two unoccupied lone pairs. And now these two dimers can approach each other and form sort of tetrahedral, three-dimensional, cage-like tetramer. If I add substituents, it will be a bit more uh, crowded, but still, this is the tetramer, a cage of four molecules, which can be uh, also visualized as formation of a tetrahedron out of four identical pieces, which are called congruent pieces. I represent here each molecule, which are identical in this tetramer, as, the, as this weird shape, but they can form a dimer and another two molecule can form a dimer and these two pieces match each other to form eventually a tetrahedron. This uh, uh, picture was featured on the, on the cover of Symmetry uh, magazine. Now, here is a, a um, Gedanken experiment. I can envision a fourth way of crystallizing of phosphonic acids. It hasn't been uh, found yet in the crystal state, but I, uh, using the, uh, the motif, the patterns, the, uh, the fragments of other structures, I could uh, propose this one. I think phosphonic acids could crystallize like this, alternating cyclic dimers, and ladder of trimeric structures. Once again, it's a, it's, a, it's a thought experiment. Now, if one cuts four molecules out of this infinite chain, these four molecules would have a, a kind of a, a hanging proton accepting and donating abilities. And one can wrap these four molecules on itself, and this what forms the cyclic tetrahedral, uh, not cyclic, this is what forms tetrahedral tetramer. Here is the same cut out, but shown as the, uh, as the piece that you can cut out with the scissors out of piece of paper. And this is one of the uh, figures in our uh, publication. So uh, in our paper, we have one of the figures that is designed to be cut off with the scissors out of the printout. Uh, then one can assemble a, a, a tetrahedron of this kind just by gluing it together and then look at it while reading the rest of the paper. 
Now, this work was uh, acknowledged at the end of the uh, paper by uh, saying that authors are grateful for Maria Polyakova for structure modeling. And Maria Polyakova is just the girl who uh, uh, designed this tetrahedron, which is my 14 year old nephew. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, so far, speaking about phosphenic, phosphoric, phosphonic acids, I was mostly talking about proton and a mass spectrum. But actually, the work started in a different way. I was interested in using phosphorus and a mass to do the same job, because out of um, out of general considerations, phosphorus should be great. It is the good NMR nucleus, 100% natural abundance, spin one half, large gyromagnetic ratio, very large range of chemical shifts, a sensitive responsive nucleus. And actually it is located very close to the place where in intermolecular non-covalent interactions are happening. In phosphines, it's just there participating in it. In phosphine oxides, in phosphates, it's just one oxygen away. So it should be a great nucleus for this kind of job. But it seems to me uh, now that this phosphorus is sitting sort of spider-like in the center of the molecule, and it is being too sensitive to too many parameters. It is sensitive to what's happening uh, with this molecule as a proton donor. It is sensitive to what is happening to this molecule as a proton acceptor. It is sensitive to direct substituents effects, changes the chemical shift significantly. It is sensitive to the conformational changes in these uh, uh, substituents, to the internal degrees of freedom within substituents or the rotational degrees of freedom. It is quite sensitive to the angles and dihedral angles uh, in the OPOH group. And the, uh, the sensitivity is... Uh, similar, there are no dominating factors. And all these factors are sort of jumbled into one observed chemical shift. And this one observed chemical shift to deconvolute this one number into all these different factors is sometimes quite hard. So in order to employ this phosphorus chemical shift for the same structure elucidation, one has to resort to looking at a very Homologous, homologous series of complexes where all the other factors are kind of being contained, controlled, not changing, and just one factor changes. So we try to do it with the dimethyl phosphenic acid, looking at the very homologous series with substituted puridines. And in this series, this molecule is held by two hydrogen bonds. Uh, uh, with this OH, it attaches to the lone pair of nitrogen and it also grabs a little bit the CH proton donating ability by the phosphonyl oxygen. So we thought that it might be uh, visualized as a little uh, hummingbird, which is drinking from the lone pair of the flower and also grabs with its uh, talons the petal of the same flower. Now, if this very homologous series are being looked at, then the phosphorus chemical shifts become quite instructive. And um, uh, without boring you with the details, we have uh, uh, managed to propose sort of a, um, numerical correlations which can get you from the phosphorus chemical shift to exactly the geometry of the hydrogen bond position of the bridging particle in this series of complexes. <laughs> but the uh, more uh, kind of summarizing the more important uh, messages, I think, in this mm, piece of work, uh, this is what I want to conclude with slightly ahead of time, but it's not bad, I think. That's um, what we are employing. We are saying that in self associates of all kinds of acids containing XOOH group, carboxylic, phosphenic, phosphonic, phosphoric, arsenic, and if we ever manage to do that also, you know, still binic and bismutinic, though there are experimental problems in synthesizing them, that's completely kind of new area of chemistry, but we're trying to do that. Uh, 
So in these uh, fragments, because of the conjugation of the proton donating and proton accepting spots, the hydrogen bonds feel each other. It means that when you mess up with one of them, the other responds. And this allows us to use the HD isotope effects. Our slight perturbation is deuteration. And what we observe is the appearance of a number of lines. This number of isotope effects allows us to count the number of hydrogen bonds and establish the stoichiometry of the complex. Knowing the stoichiometry, then we use different kind of symmetry considerations, additional mm, uh, experimental observables in order to further limit down the possibilities of uh, structures that are being formed. And uh, if I, I manage to do that, then I think, uh, at least I've tried to convince you that uh, we were able to study cyclic dimers, phosphenic acids and carboxylic acids, cyclic trimers, phosphenic phosphoric acids, cyclic tetramers, and mixed complexes of phosphenic and phosphoric acids, and cage-like uh, three-dimensional tetramers, tetrahedral ones, like in case of phosphonic acids. And I think with uh, this, I would like to wrap up and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you ever so much, Professor Tolstoy. This is really a very stimulating uh, presentation, I feel, because what you really managed is to show uh, this kind of Lego approach that is much more powerful than Lego is. And uh, maybe this is inspiration for manufacturers of toys because chemistry is much more flexible than, um, than real toys made of plastic. Um, we have the chance uh, to that you ask questions. Um, so um, the audience is not so big. So please uh, just unmute your microphone and speak. And uh, yeah, please. Are there questions from the audience? You're invited to ask. Let me see if there's a chat. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I look at the chat, the chat is not used, but then uh, let me start asking questions that I really uh, would like to ask. Um, so um, you use these liquid um, um, freons for preparing your molecules and uh, mm -hmm. this um, ties you, I would assume, to a certain temperature range. And how flexible are you to look at temperature dependent effect? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bit um, unique experimental conditions that we have to uh, employ. Now, we do have sort of a, a wiggle room for the temperature. In my experience, for hydrogen bonded complexes, they're held together uh, energetically <clears throat> by a set of you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 kilocalorie per mole. What we can realistically achieve are the temperature ranges, let's say from 100 Kelvin to 160 Kelvin, sort of this 50, 60, rarely 70 degrees. It is our wiggle room. Above that, we start to uh, uh, make faster intermolecular exchanges. Then uh, it could be interesting by themselves, but if we're interested in the intrinsic properties of complexes, this is not optimal. The situation is entirely different when we look at the intramolecular complexes. There, the molecular exchanges start, uh, or proton exchanges, should I say, start much at much higher temperatures, and often even at room temperature, the uh, intrinsic spectral parameters of a complexes are being observed. Then we have a much larger temperature range. But usually we're, we are bound to quite cool conditions. Okay. Are there in between now questions from the audience? Please unmute your microphone and then you're invited to, to speak. You know, usually the speakers at this moment are saying, well, I think everything was very clear, I think. That of is course the it is go, very go clear, to answer. But, 
but uh, I I'm uh, very much tempted to to ask you a few more questions, if I may. Um, yeah, the um, uh, the temperature is, of course, also a uh, parameter that relates the from the thermodynamically most stable structures to kinetically controlled structures. And do you find evidence for kinetic control structures, or is everything really in the uh, thermodynamic minimum what you observe? I uh, honestly do not know. And I think uh, this is because uh, we uh, start to get the reasonable spectra at already so low temperature that we just at the minimum. Now, uh, uh, what happens? Uh, well, once again, we we'll lose the, uh, the precision of our vision at higher temperatures. And that's why it might, it might be, but um, not in the, at least not in the series of complexes that have been demonstrated so far. In, in this presentation. Yeah. So. so this is, I would say, is fascinating that you get all these perfect structures. And there are, of course, other experiments that have been done in the in the past to prove that there are these cyclic structures and the bioptical spectroscopy, for example. And therefore, I think this is really clean and very fascinating uh, views into, into these intermolecular interactions. Um, let me let me ask you another question. Can you uh, shed more light into the uh, fundamental question on proton or hydrogen transfer in these uh, cyclic structures? Mm, yes, and again, thank you for this question. I did, I um, kind of purposely did not show it in this presentation, not to uh, muddle the main. Uh, line of thinking but we do have information about the proton exchange now uh, with proton exchange and without proton not exchange proton transfer sorry for misspoke uh, with a proton transfer and without proton transfer the numbers of chemically non-equivalent isotopolox are different so not only we establish a stoichiometry, we can prove without a shadow of a doubt that in a cyclic trimers, there is a fast um, triple reversible proton exchange fast in the NMR time scale. Uh, so these three protons in a cycle, they kind of jump one direction, kind of clockwise, anti-clockwise, clockwise, anti-clockwise. Anti and this is, happens rapidly enough so that um, uh, uh, all three let's say the two protons in a mono deuterated isotopolog are chemically equivalent. Otherwise they would not. If there would not be proton transfer, they would not be equivalent. And uh, this kind of reasoning, it, it, it goes to other complexes as well. So mm -hmm. we do have understanding that this is happening. Very we good. have it for uh, cyclic dimers of carboxylic acids, for uh, at least heterodimers of phosphenic acids, for trimers of phosphenic and phosphoric acids. And uh, I also can uh, also am sure that in the, this cage-like tetramer, there are no proton transfers for exactly the same reasons. It's a bit kind of a tricky and requires some three-dimensional uh, uh, imagination. So uh, uh, well, trust me on this. Uh, for, for time being, that it doesn't happen. Otherwise, again, we would have a different um, appearance of spectra, qualitatively, not quantitatively, which I like very much, because in the in a, a small changes of the numbers, one can argue for millennia. But uh, if it's qualitative feature, just number of lines, direction of shift, then it's, it becomes much more convincing for people. So that's what we strive for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there now more questions from the audience? Then from my side, I would like to ask a very last question. Um, could you get insights into the mechanisms of aggregate formation? Because the question of course arises, is this a sequential or a, um, a synchronous uh, process? Um. Mm, uh, I do not have experimental uh, features to back my uh, opinion up, 
uh, once again, because I see only the yeah, result. I understand. But I generally right. think uh, that in the uh, low temperature, uh, not in low temperature, in the low concentration conditions, it has to be sort of a pairwise reactions. Uh, in order to go so effectively, it just uh, two molecules meet each mm. other and then they meet the third molecule. Uh, to wait until uh, all three will meet up at the same time, uh, that's, uh, mm, that's much less probable. And I think it's not necessary because two molecules would already be perfectly able to form a stable complex. It will have less number of hydrogen bonds, but it will be stable nonetheless. So I think it's sequential building up of the uh, of a larger uh, complexes but mm -hmm. again it's uh, just a mm, uh, you know intuition rather than the nmr yeah, spectra yeah, I, that... understand. I understand but this is, these are i think very uh simple questions that are of fundamental importance and uh, but uh, thank you so much um i think yeah. you know, what what you said is everything was very clear and very stimulating and i think this is very good to have uh, very clear insights what happens in intermolecular interactions in these um, uh, systems and i'm very glad that you bridged organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry and so that there are common features with this i um would like to thank uh, Professor Tolstoy again. A warm thank you and uh, a big hand for, um, for him uh, for his presentation. And uh, I think. May I just uh, a Please. couple of words say? I, I have to once again uh, apologize. The university has sent me to a administrative training for some sort of reasons, doesn't matter. And again, I'm forced to leave uh, this uh, uh, session because currently at the moment I have the classes that I have to attend as a student rather than a teacher. So it's it's a weird situation, but well, I'm forced to do that. So uh, yeah. I will have to apologize and switch off from the conference. I'm very sorry for that. Yeah, but in any case, uh, everybody knows where Professor Tolstoy is based. You find him easily accessible at St. Petersburg State University, even if you're not around. And if you're in St. Petersburg, please take the opportunity to visit his labs. I, I can tell from my own experience, it's very interesting and stimulating. Thank you ever so much. Thank you for, uh, for the audience, uh, for listening and being here. And uh, with this, I will close the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rui. See you later.